Welcome to In the Trenches with Dave Lapham, brought to you by First Star Logistics. And this is part two of a two-part episode with Kyle Kasky. And we're talking war room with Kyle Kasky and all his experiences. He's got a vast knowledge, a vast uh, wealth of information in, in terms of being involved in the war room decision-making processes. And he's got some great stories. Joe Mixon, that was a very, very interesting uh, story that Kyle Kasky was involved with there. A lot goes on in making these decisions. Kyle Kasky takes us inside the war room, a place that not very many people get to be. I know you're going to like part two. So you have the mock draft conversations, you have you know, potential trades, uh, you, you kind of talk, you do the mock drafts and, and talk about, oh, this might happen, that might happen based on on w- what you know teams need and what might be out there and all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot that goes on. The interesting thing is you have a, a board by need and then a board just, you know, ranking the player. Where where does that, like, okay, where's the tiebreaker there? It, 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 is it in, in a perfect world your need and your best player available are pretty close. But if they're not, if the need is is much greater than what's left on the board, you know, obviously you go there. Oh, but if, if it's, if it's like, all right, you have a, a um, say your, your big need is corner and you're at 31 and you have a corner, the best corner left is on your board at 32, 33. And there's, uh, a defensive edge rush guy at uh, one's at thirty two, one's at thirty three, and one's at thirty four. How do you decide? Mm-hmm. All right, so you- I, I think what happens is you look at your needs, and I think this goes into the whole thing that happened last year. Is you want Jamar Chase? Do you mm-hmm. need Jamar Chase? Not, not, I mean, yeah, everybody needs Jamar Chase, but you don't need him. Need him as much as you needed, you know, Panay right. Sewell. Right now, if I'm not mistaken, who did uh, the Bengals take in their first pick of the second round? Was that Jackson Carmen? Was that his name? Yes. Yes. So they took a lineman, right? Down and and got Jackson Carmen, correct. Okay. So what what they did was they looked at it and they said, okay, we've got the best lineman in the draft in Sewell, but we've also probably got the best player in the draft in in Jamar Chase. And there's also a couple of linemen that are right there. So how much how much better is Panay Sewell than these other guys? Now he is better. Don't get me wrong. Right. But they're looking and they're saying, can we still get a starting offensive lineman a few picks later, you know, the next pick instead of having to take that guy now. So that's the way I'm sure that they looked at it. And that's the way we looked at a few other things was you got, you got guys, you go, man, we, we need a linebacker, you know, but Hey, listen, there's another linebacker. We got, you know, we got two picks in the third round or something and they're, they're 15 picks apart. Well, shoot, there's two linebackers still on our board, but there's still one offensive tackle left on the board. You know, and, and that's where you go, okay, you know, best player available is that tackle right there. And, you know, we can still get our, our linebacker. It may not be that one that's that much ahead of him, but it'll be the next guy down. So I think that's the tiebreaker is if there's something else available with the next pick. Yeah, that's interesting. You look at the 2020 draft, uh, Joe Burrow, obviously, first pick. T. Higgins, first pick of the second round. They, were, they like Logan Wilson a lot. But they were thinking, ah, oh, boy, that high in the second round, you know, mm-hmm. eh, we'll probably go with T. But they get him with the, you know, first pick in the third round. So they, yeah. they get Joe Burrow, T. Higgins, and Logan Wilson. They were talking about T. Higgins and Logan Wilson both with that second selection. And sometimes it works out that way. Uh, and then in the 2020 draft, like you said, Jamar Chase, Jackson Carmen, and Osai, who I think, edge rush guy out of Texas, I think is going to have a bright future. I mean, he got hurt, you know, and missed his rookie year. He mm-hmm. had a knee injury and he had a, had a had a wrist injury. But I mean, I this kid I think has got some uh some some push off the edge. It's it's gonna it's it's gonna be very interesting to 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 watch, you know, how how this draft how this draft unfolds. When when you're when you're um uh looking at uh um responsibilities, uh protocols, all that getting ready to what, what's the biggest What's the most important thing in your estimation as you're part of a coaching staff that's with the Cincinnati Bengals so heavily involved in the draft? What's the biggest part of preparation that leads to draft success in your estimation? 
I think just being thorough in, in the the film study, uh, I think people put too much emphasis on combine and and forty times and and drills and the what people would call the underwear Olympics. Uh, right. You know, I, knowing the I th- you got to do your thorough work on that. Um, then the next thing I'd say right behind that, almost, ex- I mean, almost right with it is you got to do a thorough background on the person. And it's not just the, the physical aspects, but it is, it's, it's, is he healthy? Is he, has he had injuries? Is he, uh, how much did he, if he's a running back, how many, how many miles does he already have on him? Things like that. But then you look at the person, you know, and that's where the, the mixing thing came in. We spent so much time on Joe. I spent almost an entire week with Joe. And, uh, you know, I, I had no doubt, but you have to go to pro days. That's why we go to pro days. We don't go to pro days to, to work these guys out. Some people say that you do, you go to a pro day to get around the guy and in, in his environment, you right. know, and, and that's where you, you do your work on that. You don't just skimp on those things. Cause that's where you see a guy and he runs fast. That's great. But what else does he do? You know, and did he, did it actually show up on film? Cause you, there's some of these guys. It's funny that some of these guys this year are saying. I think Evan is it Evan Neal. Is that that's that's the the tackle out of Alabama. Yeah, the big monster um, tackle. Yeah. He said he, he's not running a forty this year, and he said I went to Alabama so I wouldn't have to run a forty. I put it on film, <laughs> and it makes sense. I I, I get it. it because really, in all reality, why do you want to watch one of those guys run a forty? When when did you as an offensive lineman ever run a forty yard dash other than on possibly a screen? Right. And when you were chasing him down to go celebrate in the end zone on a long run, you never ran a 40, did you? In all reality, uh, you never did. The only the only time was when it was a negative. There was a turnover and you're chasing down an <laughs> interception or something like that. I mean, it, it, you're right. I mean, they, they were few and far between. There's no question about it. You, if you if you ran, you know, 10 or 15 yards, that was a big deal, you know? <laughs> no doubt. And even with the receivers, I mean, if you watch receivers, receivers, everybody wants to say, man, this receiver is so fast. He's only fast like that on a go route. And right. and even with that, he's still got to beat the guy. He's still got to get around him. He's still got to restack him. And, you know, you want to see receivers who can get out of their breaks. You want to see, honestly, you want to see receivers that can catch the ball because they're professional ball catchers in all reality. That's what they do, you know, and, and running backs, you want to see lateral quickness. You want to see acceleration out of a stop. You don't want to see straight line speed until they break through. They've got to break through first. So you want to see all those other things. And, I think that's where people get caught up with all those different aspects of that. So actual pick, the process unfolds. Uh, I don't know, pick around. It doesn't matter what round. And there's a split decision. You know, part of the room that you described, there's there's scouts, there's coaches, there's ownership, there's all kinds of people uh, in there at all levels of the organization. And I don't, I don't know if everybody has equal votes or whatever, but whatever, if it's a, if, if it's a dead heat, it's, it's, gridlocked is the tiebreaker mike does mike brown make the ultimate uh, call on that or is it revoted how, how does that process work there there's a lot of okay there's number one mike at least when i was there okay now again i i haven't been in a draft room with the Bengals since 2018 so things right. may have changed right. i know they've done a lot of uh shuffling around but I, I i highly doubt that it's changed much when it comes to this but he he mike brown has the ultimate authority when it's all said and done now what he was really good at doing was if there was an issue and there was a, a, a tie or, you know, an argument, then he let everybody speak. And if you had time, that's why we, we would actually start looking at, okay, we're going to, we got five picks to go. So in right. the first round, I mean, in real time, you're talking 20, 22 minutes, probably, you know, when it's when, cause it goes a little faster than, than that, but then you get into the second, third, and even in the later rounds, it's a lot faster than that. So you kind of, then you start talking like 10 picks ahead, but uh, you, you get in little arguments and, and it's fine. There were some heated arguments and there were times that, you know, with Marvin, Marvin would have to, uh, you, you know, go ahead and calm the argument down and he would give his, his say on what he thought. And right. then it would pass on to, uh, you know, it, it, it had a process like it, it position coach, scouts, coordinators, head coach, uh, the ownership family, and then ultimately with Mike Brown. So I know when we were, uh, picking, uh, uh, Andy Dalton, um, Ryan Mallett was still available, I believe. And, uh, there was a, a debate between the two and, uh, it came down to, uh, the coordinator, Jay Gruden was standing on the table at the time for, uh, Andy and Marvin backed Jay 
And, you know, I know some, there were some other people in the building that wanted Ryan Mallett and Mike Brown just made a decision when it was done. And it was made literally probably with four minutes left on the clock of the, of that, of the first round pick and, or the second round pick rather, I'm sorry. Uh, right. It was about probably four minutes, maybe three minutes left and it wasn't much time and it was handed off. And then it was still debated until it actually laid on the table and the phone call was made. So uh, it, it, you know, and, and those are, those are, those are fun ones actually to, to go through and it's good stories, but there's some picks that are just easy. I mean, I'm sure Joe Burrow, there wasn't any conversation about it once it was kind of done after, you know, I'm sure that pick was ready two weeks before the draft at least. Right. Like AJ Green, I bet mean, there wasn't a oh. whole lot of, no no debate on that bad boy, was there? No debate on that. That was just that. I remember we we talked about. I want to say there was there was somebody who else was in that draft? Julio Jones. Um, there was there was another there was another was, receiver yeah. in that draft, and uh, there was a debate. And I remember ha half the room just said, "There's no debate," and the other <laughs> half goes, "You're right," <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> So you mentioned Darren Simmons is in on everything, uh, being the special yep. team coach. And and that obviously is a big part of a tiebreaker in the decision-making mm -hmm. process. What can this guy give us? Not only, okay, we don't project him necessarily right away to be a starter, depending on you know what the need is and what position he's playing and all that sort of thing. But can he give us those valuable special team snaps? Does Darren Simmons have a big, big say in tiebreaker in that situation, obviously? He does when, especially like you said, when he's not an immediate starter. So a lot of the non, the non starting skill guys. So if it's I, somebody we're looking at as a, like Cody core uh, played for the Bengals for however many years. And then yeah. I think he played for the giants for a couple more years after that. He, he, he was one of those guys we looked at and said, man, this guy can be really good on teams. And then uh, James Wright, uh, I don't know if you remember him or not, but he, he was uh, yeah. um, the do you know how many you know how many receptions he had at LSU his senior year? Five. None. None? Really? I believe wow. it was none. And wow. but he he was also playing behind Odell Beckham, Jarvis Landry, and those guys, and they were playing in a pro style offense. So right. he wasn't seeing the field much. And but you look at those guys, and that's where Darren comes in because he sees the other stuff these guys are doing. He sees the blocking they do, he sees the kickoff returns and the punt returns and right. all those things. And you know, linebackers are a big deal. The, the linebackers are where they really come in because linebackers, tight ends, running backs, those are the ones that if you watch punt teams and kickoff teams and kickoff return teams, linebackers, running backs, and tight ends take up a lot of that space. You know, some you get, then you just fill it in with all the safeties and speed guys you need. But uh, those guys that aren't going to be starting, Darren has – and this is late in the draft. Like late in the draft, it gets to a point where it's like, Darren, do you have a guy? You know, do you have a returner? Yeah. Is there somebody that you want to be a returner that maybe you want to bring on uh, uh, Brandon Wilson, for example, um, you know, big, big pick for, uh, for Darren, sure. you know, Darren helped Darren was big in getting him on the team. And that was, that was why, because he was a returner. Right. So how big is resetting the board after day one, after day two, you know, going into day three, uh, you guys, obviously when, when final pick is made, you're reshuffling your board. Does that process start even before the final, you know, few picks are made because there's only those few picks or do you wait until everything's done completely and then start to reshuffle that board? Uh, once the final pick for the Bengals was made, we would then have a real quick talk. Cause usually on, on first and second rounds, it's pretty late at night. Right. And uh, you know, everybody's just kind of worn out at that point. So we, it, everybody has a talk about, all right, hey, here's what we're looking at early tomorrow. Get your mind right on on these positions. You know, um, hey, Kyle, we might be taking a running back first pick of the fourth round or whatever it is, and just be ready for it on Saturday morning. And right uh, now, uh, what we what we would do, like I said, we had the board that was the needs board, and we had the board that was best player available board. Those boards would then be cleaned up, and they would be kind of rewritten up on the board, and it would be cleaner when you go in the next day instead of just kind of being scattered around and, you know, mark marking through it, I would actually be cleaned up more and ain't more names would be added at that point, because you would have the college free agents on the, on the Saturday, on, on the day on Saturday, day three, um, after the first round, when you, we would come in on, on Friday and we would have a big talk because those, those are two big picks, you know, obviously with the second, the third round, 
and we would talk all our way through those two. Now on Saturday, we would usually talk through the fourth round and then kind of reassess as the day went along. Um, but it, there is a lot of, of – there's more meetings, let's put it that way. There's another couple hours worth of draft meetings, at least for the coaches, the scouts, and the owners meet all day on Friday. Uh, after the first round. So they, they're in there all day talking through things. So there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. Give us a couple of, uh, a couple of drafts picks that, uh, that you were part of the process on that, you know, you, you'll never forget. I mean, it was for one, one reason or another, it'll stick in your mind forever. It's like, we, we can't believe this guy's there or whatever the case may be. It, it, what do you think um, is the craziest uh, thing you were involved with? Craziest thing I was involved with, and I think everybody's heard the story, was Muhammad Sanu. Um, somehow or another, somebody called him and said that, hey, you're getting drafted by in the second round by the Bengals. And uh, we were like, it, stuff was going off about us drafting Muhammad Sanu, and it, we ended up picking, I don't remember who we picked. And it, it was a big deal. And the crazy thing is, it actually revolved right back around to the next round, I believe, and we actually took him. Right. And it was it was just such a weird stretch of events when it happened, because like all of us were in there saying, what is this new stuff we're hearing? Uh, I mean, we like him. Yeah, sure. But we didn't we haven't made that pick yet. And um, I'd say other than that, uh, for, for me in particular, I, I still go back to the to the mix and pick. Um, we we had that second round pick and. Uh, Minnesota called and uh, Zim offered to move. We moved back, I believe, eight spots, and um, they took Dalvin Cook. I, that's the reason I believe that we we traded it because we knew right. we wanted Joe, and right. he said, "No, we're taking Cook." So we we're like, "Okay, cool." And we looked at who was behind it, and there was a couple teams that could have taken Joe, but Joe was off so many people's boards that year that we took the chance. And I remember I was so mad when we when we traded it because I wanted I wanted to get that pick done. And I walked out for a minute, cooled off, and I came back in, and uh, we ended up getting him. And I just remember being so nervous, just trying to keep my keep my calm. With uh, you know, I just like I hope we don't lose this guy. And you know, I mean, obviously he's ended up being a heck of a player for the Bengals. And um, but yeah, that that was probably stressful. And then the you know, I think the other one with me um, was would be that first pick that I had as a running back coach was Jeremy Hill. And I, I know pe people can give Jeremy a hard time all they want. Jeremy was a good player for us. And, um, you know, he had a, obviously had a bad play in the playoffs and, right. um, you know, but if you like, again, one play doesn't define a player. I don't think, you know, if you look at all the other stuff, the guy was a thousand yard rusher, uh, uh, for the Bengals. So, I mean, guy had more touchdowns by, you know, the first, first two years, like he, he led the, he led first and second year guys in touchdowns or something, some weird stat I heard one time, but he was a good player, but we, we had him, we had Carlos Hyde on the board. And I remember um, I was kind of pushing for for Hyde for a little while, and uh, Hugh was pushing for Jeremy. And Hugh and I had uh, a little powwow, and uh, you know we came out saying, "Okay, I agree, let's take Jeremy." And it was fine. It, but it was stuff like that. You had, uh, you know, I mean, Hugh was going to win. He was a coordinator. He was going to win over me. It was fine. And right. but uh, you, you know, I wanted to state my case, and I was I was a new position coach, and I was taking over his position. So, you know, it was, it was an interesting conversation. And Hugh and I had always worked really, really well together. So it, it was, that was a, that was a good one. Other than that, I mean, I'd say that AJ Andy draft was, was crazy because that was a lockout year and yeah. we yeah. couldn't, we couldn't do anything with them after we drafted them. And it was very odd because you, you, you had a first and a second round draft pick that were going to be your starters at, at very important positions and you couldn't do anything with them. That, that is, uh, that's crazy. I mean, what about the Andrew Whitworth selection, man, to take that, that turned out to be a pretty darn good pick, you know, with the second yeah. round, so many, so many guys, so many second round picks. I mean, not, not just guys, not just guys in, in the thirties. Let's talk about other second round picks. Dunlap went in the second round. Ray Mawaluga did wit Corey Dillon, Darnay Scott, Carl Pickens, Harold Green, Eric Thomas, Ray Horton. I mean, <laughs> Second round has been a has been a good round for the uh, for the Cincinnati Bengals. There's there's no question about it. Third round has been you know you can you can find Kenny Anderson, greatest player in franchise history, third round pick out of Tiny Augustana. So it, it's 
Boomer Sison, you know, another great quarterback, second round pick. It, it doesn't Andy Dalton, second round pick. The top three Ooh. quarterbacks in Bengals franchise history, none were first round picks. Carson Palmer, obviously, another talented player, was a first round pick. I, it, it it happens in all shapes, sizes, forms, no no doubt about it. Yeah. And again, I think it goes down to as well as when you have the coaches doing the uh, helping in the draft that the coaches can look at a player and say, I feel like I can develop this guy as well. Yeah. So if you, if you find a guy, if you're an offensive line coach and you see Clint bowling and he's still sitting there in the fourth round. And I remember Clint's whole thing was, Oh, he's a little stiff. He's, you know, uh, he, he didn't really ever just maul guys and this and that. And I remember, you know, going, okay, but he's a good player. And, uh, you know, Paul, Paul Alexander said, you know, I can develop this guy. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I know Paul, Paul's very, very picky about the guys he gets. And um, uh, there's certain guys maybe he looked at and said, man, I, you know, they took this guy and I got to work with this guy. And, but there's guys that you go, I really can develop this guy. And, you know, I think that's where uh, those later round picks come in, come in handy for the coaches because those are the guys you say, I, yeah, we can do something with this guy over time. Um, you know, like a guy, uh, this is a college free agent. This guy wasn't even drafted. Trevor Robinson uh, out of Notre Dame mm -hmm. uh, played center for the Bengals uh, when Kyle Cook went down. Right. Um, I don't I remember 2012 or somewhere in that range. And uh, I remember I was scouting. I was assistant offensive line coach at the time. And I, I remember I was scouting – Notre Dame and I saw this guy this, he was playing guard for him and he was pulling and just knocking the crap out of ends like he was trapping these ends and just putting them on their backs and he but he had 31 inch arms well I go to Paul and I go he goes, he goes no he's got 31 inch arms 31 and a half inch arms and for those out there listening that's very short for a, an NFL offensive lineman even uh you okay. know the, the interior your know, most interior guys are 33 right. most tackles are 35 36 so um we brought him in as college free agent and the kid just kept playing. He knew how to use it. He he could get his hands in there and uh, he developed them. And, you know, it's one of those things, sometimes you got to take a chance on, on the kid and the film than you do on the measurements. Sometimes. You mentioned uh, college free agent, a good example right there at Robinson. The Bengals have over the years really done an excellent job with college free agents. It's something that is paid a lot of attention to, Mm -hmm. take us through that process that that's that's about as big as getting ready for the draft isn't it yeah and, and this is uh it's close to a stock market as you'll ever get i mean it is a it's a boiler room now and when the so when the when the draft ends when your last pick is done you start you know feeling out to agents and things and then uh you get you get a, you're in touch with these guys anyway as is before the draft so you look at a guy um we had a guy terrell watson um, out of Azusa Pacific and yeah. I, 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 Terrell was one of my one of my favorite players and uh, he, he was a guy he was just he, he was like the I don't know a 2,000 yard rusher at Azusa Pacific or something but I knew he wasn't gonna get drafted so I started you know loving him up loving up the agent um, you, you know getting getting to the point where I had a relationship built with both of them and uh, you after the draft's over you start calling these guys that you've made relationships with or you look at a guy that maybe we thought was going to be drafted and fell out and right. didn't get drafted. And you start calling his agent, you start calling the kid and being like, Hey, listen, you know, I'm running back coach with Bengals. Hey, you know, we, we didn't draft anybody this year. Uh, we, you know, we're really looking to, to add some, some depth in here. We'd love to have you a chance to come make our team. And um, they start talking about the signing bonus. Well, there's a certain amount of signing bonus that each team has and the numbers changed, but at one point it was 75 or something. Now they've jumped to 110 or something, but you have that much money to give all your signees. And then those are signing bonuses. So some sign some guys need 30,000 to sign them. Some guys don't need anything. Some guys don't get anything. Um, but I think sometimes these agents and kids stop, start looking into, well, the Cowboys are offering me 30 and you're only offering me eight. Okay. But are you going to make the Cowboys team? And that's where you got to go into that, you know, your rookie minimum, if you make the team, is I don't know, back in the day it was four hundred eighty-five thousand. I think it's over five hundred now if you're a rookie. So That's you make the team in six months, you're going to be making five hundred thousand dollars, as opposed to you know that twenty-two thousand dollar difference between what we're paying you now. 
you can go to the Cowboys and get $22,000 more now. And okay, great. You won't make anything else after that. And, or you might make the practice squad and you're still going to make good money. You're still gonna make a hundred thousand, but I'm talking, I'm telling you right now, you've got as good a shot to make the team here as you do anywhere. And that's a lot of money. And all I have right now to offer you is eight. And that's where you got to fight through that sometimes. And then it's funny because you, you, you get all these agents and they want to say, Oh no, I got it. I got this offer. I got this offer. And then you go sign your guys. And then, you know, the, after the draft on Saturday, I always like to go out to dinner or, you know, find some friends and kind of relax a little bit. And all of a sudden, you know, you're, uh, you know, a couple on, you know, a couple of appetizers in, maybe a couple of cold pops in and you, all these agents start calling you, Hey man, uh, you still got room for my man. Um, <laughs> sorry, bud. You know, you should have signed when I offered it and, yeah. you know, it, it's a, it, but it goes on and it, those, those calls actually come like, cause if you have a rookie mini camp the next week, that's why I don't know if you realize or not um, the, I know you did, but like the, the normal uh, casual observer of the Bengals maybe didn't realize that rookie mini camp sometimes was two weeks after the draft instead of a week after the draft. Well, there's a reason for that. That was because all, you could have let all these other teams have their rookie mini camps and they would cut people. And then that gives you a whole new pool of college free agents to go look at, you know, and that, that's why the, that's why a lot of teams will do it two, two weeks after instead of the, just the week after. So right. it gives you a chance to add some, add some more guys if you need to. Well, I'll tell you, this was uh, thoroughly enjoyable. I you know that the draft has become its own made for entertainment. TV. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it, entertainment. It is. It's, it's, it's incredible. It's, it's become a, a huge, uh, everybody marks it on the calendar, man. There's no doubt about it. It's, it's a, it's a massive three day event and to get the inner workings of what goes on. Uh, it was a lot of fun, man. Appreciate your time. Yeah. Appreciate you giving us, uh, giving us a lot of, a lot of good memories, good stories. Somebody's yeah. life's changing here. A lot of guys lives are changing in the next couple of weeks. They get yeah. to fulfill their dream, man. I can remember getting drafted like it was yesterday, and that was not yesterday. It was a long time mm -hmm. ago. No two ways about it. But uh, when you get a chance to fulfill a life, a lifelong goal, lifelong ambition, man, there's nothing like it. So appreciate you. Appreciate you, Kyle Kasky. You're a good man. I appreciate you having me on. And I'd say one piece of advice for any any guy who is out there that is either going to have a chance to be in the NFL or or – that uh, we'll have a chance to try out. Uh, don't ever go in thinking you know everything. Mm -hmm. Go in with a clean slate. Go in, go in and give everything you got. Be humble, and and don't just be be a be a normal person when you go in there and work and play football. That's what it's about. And all the other stuff will take care of itself. And that's the biggest thing I would say because we had so many guys come in, and their egos got in the way, and you know, it just didn't work out. So, but again, I appreciate you having me on and uh, this has been a lot of fun. Appreciate you. That's, that's great advice. I mean, go in there and be a sponge, man. Ask questions, ask good questions, be a sponge. No doubt. Yeah. No, no question about it. It's, it, you know, it's all about relationships. I mean, even, even, you know, professional football, it's like any, any job that you're going to be a part of. It's all about being able to get along with people in relationships. That's what it is. Yep. That's, that's, that's life. I mean, everything about it, even, even this coaching world is, you know, I'm going to get a job again. It's because I have a relationship with somebody. It's not because somebody's going to look at my resume and see it there. It's going to be because somebody knows what I, what I'm about and the kind of person I am. And, you know, it'll come around. And I think it goes to coaching too, is, uh, you know, I don't look like a normal running back coach, but you know, when you go in and people say, man, you played fullback. Yeah, I played fullback, but I, I know a lot about the position and they all, all players want is somebody to help them get better. And if you can show that you can help them get better and help them get their second contract and help them be successful, it doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. And, uh, you know, I think that that's the, the main thing about players too. We don't care where you come from as coaches. We don't care if you came from, you know, some division three or, you know, I don't even know if the NAIA is still around, but, you know, you come from a small school, you come from Alabama, it doesn't matter. You know, yep. it, you just come out and play. Yep. That's right. Everybody's, everybody's on equal footing at that point in time. Yeah. Little uh, trivia note on Kyle Kasky while he was at Texas A&M. I think you're at least, I know it was all conference discus thrower. Got that yes, on the track and field and little, how far did you toss the discus? 
Uh, 182 feet, six inches. How about that? That was all conference, wasn't it? I uh, placed seventh in the Big 12, which the top eight were all conference. So out of out of 12 schools, I placed seventh out of all, all the 12 schools, which is pretty, you know. And that, and that that counted. I had two of my teammates ahead of me, too. So I was actually third on the Aggies that year, but I was wow. seventh in the Big 12. And Man. the guy who won, the guy who won actually won the whole thing. He won the NCAA that year. Is that right? Yeah. Big, big, big German, Tolga Koziaglu. Really? Say that yeah. two times fast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my man. Take care of yourself. Take care of your family. All right. you got, your boys are, are five, three, and six months? Five, three, and six months. Olsen just turned five on uh, Saturday. Uh, Colton's three, and Bowden is six months. We had him in October. Man, you guys, 24 hours isn't enough, is not it? I mean, that's not enough hours in a day, is it? <laughs> There's no sleep. You know, nobody sleeps around here, you know. We, Coke, you know, the, the soda pop and uh, and and coffee and it's all the caffeine we can get in our system right now. I hear that, Coach. Have a good one, Kyle. You're the best. Right. Thank you. At First Star Logistics, we're a very strict company that really puts the pressure on our employees. <laughs> Breaks? What are those? That's what I'm talking about, Icky. Get the body right, then the mind's right. You know, yeah. you know, you gotta get that body right. That's right. right. Yes, sir. <laughs> Become a star with a chance to earn the highest commission percentages in the industry as a freight broker agent. Check out firststarlogistics.com.